So what micro means in economics is dealing with the individual, with the individual level, individual action, the market, prices, dealing with demand, supply, production, the oil price thing which is happening, so forth and so on. These, these things are part of micro. Macro deals with the larger pictures, like inflation, unemployment, business cycles. That's where everybody forecasts, economists forecast every year and always, always get it wrong. Forecasts are always way off the beam. That's macro. Micro is in pretty good shape. I think it's basically a, sort of a consensus about micro. Macro is pretty screwed up for good reason. But at any rate, we're dealing now with sort of the basic economics. The macro is, even good macro is essentially based on micro. So it's best to take micro first. All right, we deal in economics with, we don't deal only with numbers and graphs. As usually happens in economics, the graphs came in and the numbers came in in order to simplify, to present a simple basis of, of theory. Everybody got enchanted with a graph. The graphs became an end of themselves, and economists began to lose sight of the actual people and what's going on in the world. That's been a danger in the higher stratospheric reaches of economic theory. What we're dealing with, economics really deals with, is the individual, and starts with a very simple fact, simple basic fact, namely everybody has goals which they're trying to achieve, he or she is trying to achieve. The goal can be a very simple one, like eating a sandwich in one hour. Simple, short-run goal. It can be a much longer goal. Graduating from poly, or getting a job in electrical engineering, or whatever. There's a whole structure of goals. And in order to achieve these goals, you have to employ resources of some sort. You have to do something. In other words, by having goals of a sort, you're assuming that people can achieve them, at least can take measures it takes steps to buy a ham sandwich or to find a newspaper or to buy a hi-fi set or whatever, or to graduate from poly. These things are at least presumably accomplishable. Okay. In other words, everybody has different objectives in mind and has an idea of how to arrive at it, how to go about it. This is basically the, the source of economic theory. Economic theory is a deductive system built on this and this basic fact. When economists call action, in other words, the fact that people act in the world to accomplish something. And as I say, the accomplishment can be very short run, it can be very simple, it can be eating a sandwich, or it can be very complex, a whole series of things. It doesn't matter. From the point of view of economics, it doesn't matter what the goals are. That's up to some other discipline to worry about. What we deal with is the fact that people employ resources of different sorts to arrive at goals. Okay, this is what action is. You have goals and you've got resources to try to achieve them. This is also called a means-ends relationship. You have an end or an objective, and you employ a mean, different means to try to achieve it. Okay, what are some of the resources? Well, in the first place, economists like to deal with what's known as Crusoe economics. Uh, Robinson Crusoe, if you're familiar with this little tale, also been in the movies, where the guy shipwrecked and he winds up on an island somewhere in the South Pacific, and he's got no resources except himself. He has different goals as to achieve. One, he's got to keep alive. Seems to be the basic before you can accomplish anything else. So in the case of Crusoe, the reason why we like to use this is it's a stark situation where we can isolate one person. We can take one person vis-a-vis -vis nature and bring in other people later on. That's how you sort of deal in economics. You take one simple situation and you add on a more complex situation after you analyze it. So if you have Crusoe, okay, he's got different goals or objectives. Food, he looks around fast to find out what the sources of food are. Shelter and clothing or whatever. So that's you know, some of his priorities, and he lists them in a certain rank. What are his means? What are his resources that he has? Well, he looks around. First of all, he's got himself. He's got his own, his own personal energy. And he's got his own technological knowledge. Presumably, he doesn't have amnesia. He knows how to fish or chop down trees or build a bow and arrow or something like that. Technology is low-tech. High-tech doesn't make it on Desert Island or Cuso Island. Unfortunately, the knowledge about how to construct a computer or something, how to use it, is not going to do him much good. But low-tech, even if it's low-tech, it's an important tech for him, namely how to fish and how to hunt and that sort of stuff, how to construct a log cabin. All right, so he's got technological ideas. And he's also got different natural resources. Looks around, he's got, let's see, there's trees or there's fish. Looks around and finds out what the natural resources are. And that's what he starts off with. Starts off with technological ideas, his own personal energy, and natural resources. And this is basically what we have in the world in general. The world starts off, you look at the caveman, caveman start off with just a person, some kind of ideas of what to do, and resources, person's resources. Now, economics really begins as a discipline 
late 18th century England, Britain, we're sort of stuck with a, with a language. A lot of the language of the concepts we're still stuck with, even though the words are a little different now, we have to adjust to that. We can't change the word. We just have to explain why it's a little different. Similarly here, personal energy used to be called labor. This is called labor, labor energy. And nowadays when we think of labor, we think of a proletariat type. Since Marxism came in, we think of a laborer or somebody who's working a steel mill or something like that. This concept of labor means anybody who works in production, we haven't defined production, it means doing something in the, in the world to transform it for consumer goods. We'll get to that later. So everybody is a laborer in that sense. Anybody who works in production is a laborer in this sense. The president of General Motors is a laborer, just as the guy who works on the assembly line. Who isn't a laborer? Well, people who are clipping coupons. It doesn't mean they're not important, just they're not laborers. People who are stockholders, per se, or bondholders, are not engaging in personal labor in the plant. So this labor, which really means here personal energy. Natural resources, since it was 18th century agricultural Britain, is called land, the famous land and labor. So we use, we're stuck with the word land, we're stuck with the word labor, but again, it doesn't quite mean what we think of in common sense terms now. Land in economics means ground land, it means natural resources. It, means the, it doesn't mean, in other words, this building here. We think of land, we think of the building. We think of it as the building here, but land is considered in economics only the ground underneath. In other words, nature made and not man made. So land also includes fish, whose natural resources on the water, it includes water. See, when they were making up economics in the 18th century, water was not considered a scarce resource. It was considered super abundant. So they have plenty of wet agriculture. Nowadays, we, we know better. Water is scarce. So water is a scarce resource. Fish are a scarce resource. Also, other things like TV channels, frequencies, things like that, are also land in, this, in that sense. That was the natural resources. Space is land. Ocean is land. Lots of resources in the ocean which haven't been tapped yet. There's mineral in the, in the bottom of the, of the sea and things like that. This is all land, unquote, quote, unquote. In other words, natural resources. So land means natural resources. Labor means personal energy. Okay, what else is there? What else is everything else? In other words, people, man, take natural resources and transform them in order to get to what? To consumer goods so they can use it. In other words, Crusoe's got to eat. He's got to take the resources. He's got to shoot, shoot the deer or catch the fish and eat it. So he's got to do various things to get to consumer goods. The objective of, of working hard to do this is to wind up with consumer goods, wind up with food, shelter, clothing, high five sets or whatever. These things are consumer goods, used as an end of themselves. This is what the objective of action is all about. Consumer goods are coming off the assembly line, so to speak. Everything else, which is not labor or natural resources, is called capital goods. What's capital consists of everything used in production, which is not land or labor. It could be the net, fishing, a net to use for fishing, pole if you're to fish, bow and arrow to hunt, anything like that. Anything right now can be roads, trucks, tires on a truck. All these things are factories, of course, goods. In process, all these things are part of capital until you get to the consumer. For example, if you just ate a ham sandwich with Michelangelo, let's take that, one of my favorite examples. The end process of millions of people engaged in production. By the way, what is production? Production is a transformation, the use of labor, working on natural resources to transform into capital, different types of capital, but finally you wind up with consumer goods. So production is this whole process of starting with land and labor and winding up with consumer goods, so different degrees of capital. So, for example, let's take a ham sandwich in Michael Lansdorff. You have an enormous amount of cooperating factors in there. It's a whole production tree or a structure of production, starting with a farmer and miner and so forth, going for about 30 years at least until you get to the ham sandwich. Okay, what do you got? You got different ingredients going into it. To produce the ham sandwich, to sell it to the consumer, you got to have the ham, of course. You have to have the bread. You have cheese, butter, yeah, tomato, <laughs> lettuce. Okay, all these things got to be brought together on a retail level. And you have to have the workers and aprons and counters, okay? Yeah, you got to have counters and refrigerator units, you know, all that sort of stuff. And chairs. Somebody's got to produce the chair so you can sit on it. All these things have to be produced. They all have to be combined to get to the one ham sandwich. It has to be produced for many years. The ham is sold by a wholesaler, and they get it from a jobber, or it's like Eastern Seaboard. And they get it from Chicago. You get the meat packer. The meat packer is, you know, package the meat and have the slaughterhouses. The slaughterhouse gets it from a farmer and raises the pigs. They have to have stockyards. They have to have trucks in every step of the way and gasoline for the trucks and tires. 
I mean, on and on and on. This is only for the ham. The pigs have to eat. And they usually eat corn. The corn has to be grown and on and on and on. With machinery every step of the way. And this is, and, and all this, I say, is just from one unit. And it takes 30 years. It involves millions of people for one lousy ham sandwich. That's incredible. And every country in the world probably is involved in this. People growing ebony for pencils in Africa and so forth and so on, which is then, because you have to have paper, you have to have pencils to record all this stuff and figure out what's going on. At least, so every step of the way, you have to have land, at least to grow on, you have to have different kinds of capital, and you have to have labor. The interesting thing is it works. At every step of the way, one of the amazing things about the market, the free market economy, is it all works. For me to get a ham sandwich right today, you don't have to have some world planning board, eight guys on the planning board sitting around 30 years ago, I say, let's see, on January 28, 1986, we have to get raw fodder ham sandwich. Therefore, you've got to go, go raise the pigs. You over there go raise the corn and so forth. We've got to get raw fodder ham sandwich. Nobody does that. There's no world planning board trying to figure this out. If there were, we'd all be in big trouble. And yet it all works. At every step of the way, all these things happen at every step of the way with no shortages and no surpluses. Everything fits together like a lattice work structure. The market economy is like a lattice work, like a, like a lace thing. It all fits in. How come it all fits in? What? There's no planning board that fits it all in. The market itself does it. And really what microeconomics is is to study how the thing works and what happens when the government intervenes in the process and screws everything up. The big factor here, which is true both in Crusoe and for us, the big factor is this. We contrast the world with a garden, what I call the Garden of Eden model. Some people believe mankind used to be in the Garden of Eden and was then kicked out for various transgressions. Whether it's true or not, it's an interesting model to look at. In the Garden of Eden, everybody satisfies his or her wants in unlimited fashion, with no work, no nothing. Snap your fingers and Pepsi is, is trickling down your throat. Nobody has to work at it, nobody has to produce it. Why is that? Because there's no scarcity. If there's no scarcity, you don't need private property, you don't need labor, you don't have to work. Unfortunately, we were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, if it ever existed. And so in the world as it exists, uh, in human history, there's tremendous scarcity. You don't have unlimited abundance of all factors of production, of all goods. The Garden of Eden model is unlimited abundance of all desired for goods. If somebody wants to hear a symphony, they snap their fingers and get it right, right there. We haven't got that. We have to have somebody working to produce it. And so what we have is the ever-present fact of scarcity. Scarcity meaning scarcity of resources relative to the goals that we have and we've got to try to accomplish. Scarcity of resources. Scarcity, well, we'll see in a minute what the resources are. Obviously, the scarcity of land, labor, and capital. Scarcity in the sense that we'd like to have more of it. If we had more of it, we could produce more, consume more, we could have higher standards of living. If we had no scarcity, if everything was super abundant, we wouldn't have to work, we wouldn't have to worry about anything, we just have seed trickling down our throat, just like that, or whatever equivalent. Well, what happens is the caveman has everything is extremely scarce. They're in bad shape. Crusoe is in bad shape. Everything is very scarce. He's going to die tomorrow if he doesn't get food immediately. The progress of the human race, the progress of civilization, is essentially the alleviating of scarcity. Scarcity is still there, just with a lot less of it. A lot further from the brink than Crusoe was or the caveman was. A higher living standard. So the, the, the progress of the human race is essentially the progressive diminution or alleviation of scarcity. Scarcity is still there, but just a lot less of it. In the intellectual world, there's sort of fashions. You know, one of the few good things about being at my advanced age is I've seen them all. I've seen the, all the fashions come and go. Every five years, some new nut comes on. Well, the new theory, and everybody adopts it for about five years and then forgets it five years later. One nutty theory that came in about 1970 was there's no more scarcity. Economics, microeconomics might have been correct for the old days when there was scarcity. Now there's no scarcity. It's called, we live they said, in a post-scarcity world. What does that mean? I don't know what it means. What it really would mean is we're back in the Garden of Eden. Nobody has to work, nobody has to produce. No, not. Obviously, we're not in that situation. I remember I had a debate with some turkey, I think it was the American University in Washington, which is an odd place anyway. I was on the question about, do we live in a post-scarcity world? He was maintaining we live, we live in a post-scarcity world, therefore we don't have to work, and therefore, I don't know what this therefore was, it was all very murky. His conclusion was we should therefore have socialism. I'm not sure why that was the conclusion. Presumably, if there's no scarcity, you can have anything you want. Deuces are wild. So I said, well, if it's true that Professor so-and-so is right that we live in a post-scarcity world, why does he tear up his paycheck? Uh, why, does he, why doesn't he at least tear up his raises that he gets every year? And anyway, his answer was interesting. That's because I, too, have been sucked into the capitalist ethos. So it's interesting to reply. <laughs> in other words, he's also saying, he's admitting there is scarcity, and he's trying to alleviate it as much as every, anybody else. That has been forgotten. I haven't heard that for a long time now about post-scarcity. As a matter of fact, the next fashion that came in shortly after that, I think by 1975, my God, everything is scarce. 
We're going to run out of resources. That was a big gimmick for about five years. From 1975 to 1980, the same jerks who are claiming we live in a post-scarcity world, and therefore we should have socialism. I don't know how the therefore comes in. I can never figure that out. But anyway, then said from 75 to 80, we live, all resources are running out. Oil is going to run out. Energy is going to run out. Forests are going to run out. Therefore, we should have socialism. The conclusion is always the same. <laughs> There's never any connection. Then you have to run around refuting that. And it turned out by 1980, they shut up after that because there's plenty of resources. I mean, there is scarcity, like there always has been, but there's, there's plenty of resources. Nothing ran out. We'll get into the oil caper, by the way, fairly shortly. We'll get into the whole energy crisis, the alleged energy crisis and all the rest of it. It's an interesting example of this, this stuff in action. So we have an ever-present scarcity of resources. And people left, therefore have to allocate their resources to the highest values so they're their highest values, and try to make sure that they don't waste them, in the sense that they make sure they don't spend their time or their energy or whatever, and stuff they'll regret, figure that they really should have spent on something else. So this sort of, so these resources, by the way, also include time. Time is a resource, scarce, as you all know. What are you going to do tonight? What are you going to do for the, a block of hours from, say, 8 to 11 or something? You have all sorts of choices. Every person has a concrete choice. You can go to a whole bunch of movies, well, not all at once. See people, you can do homework. Each of you could probably get a list right now of seven or eight things you could do tonight. How do you decide what you do? Well, you decide on great basis of your own personal values, which you think is most important, which you think is more fun. Whatever it is, you decide one way or the other. It doesn't have to be an excruciating decision. You don't have, have to spend 10 hours on it. You can make a snap judgment. Economists, again, don't care about how long it takes to make a decision. That's not our bag. That's the psychologist or whatever. What we're interested in is the fact Everybody's got scarce resources, everybody's got goals they're trying to achieve, scarce time, scarce money, scarce labor, scarce capital, whatever, and they're trying to allocate as best they can, best possible advantage. If you pick a movie, a certain movie, movie X, and you go to that, it turns out it was a bummer, you think, damn it, I wasted time and money, you wasted the money going to it, and you wasted wasted the time, you could have gone to something else, you could have done something else. So you're looking back, you figure you took a loss, a psychic loss on it. The other half was a good movie, figure it's a psychic gain, you benefited from this. Everybody looks at the prospect that he tries to do the best he can, or she can. Looking back, you say, well, gee, that was good, or it was a bad action, or a good action. It was too costly, or it was a loser. You figure out the next time you won't go to the movie with this director in it, a movie with this particular actor in it, because often the same actor usually appears in the same kind of movies. So you learn from experience, hopefully. You do better next time, presumably. Talking about Crusoe and also about... Life in general, I'm shifting back and forth between them. We have uh, personal energy, which is full of labor, natural resources, full of land, and everything else which are called capital goods. Everything else which transforms, where labor works on natural resources, transforms them, finally getting to consumer goods. And as the economy develops and progresses, more and more capital is built up. But Cusso, all he's got is a bow and arrow or something. But we've got an enormous amount of capital equipment factories, raw material, mines, roads, tires, everything else, designed to take natural resources and transform them, move them over vast spaces, and finally get to the consumers and sell on consumer goods. That's how the, the whole economy is oriented. Another thing about human action in general, about Crusoe and about life in general, is that it takes time. Everything takes time. Some things take less time. Others take more time. And everybody prefers having stuff now than waiting for it. So anybody is, has a choice of, aside from price changes, assume prices remain the same, somebody says, I'll, give, I'll either give you a million dollars now or ten years from now, which you're going to pick, obviously you'll pick now. This is called time preference. People prefer getting stuff, achieving their goals earlier than later. And this conflicts in a sense, it has to be balanced against the fact people prefer getting stuff now than later, but the more they save and invest, the higher their standard of living will be in the future. So they have to choose between consuming now or saving up now and consuming more later. That's the basic. We'll get to that more later on. But anyway, these things take time, and also there's time preference. And also, action is risky. There's uncertainty of the world. And uh, the function of the entrepreneur is to meet that uncertainty, to bear the risk of uncertainty. Crusoe is an entrepreneur. In a sense, he hopes he can catch fish, or he hopes he can build a cabin, things like that. Well, everybody's an entrepreneur. To become a mechanical engineer, you hope or expect that you have to be able to get a good job in it. More entrepreneurial are the capitalists who invest a lot of money in this in certain processes and hope they'll make money out of it. So this is called entrepreneurship. There's no good English word for it. It's a French word. It's now been incorporated in the English language. Adam Smith used the word undertaker, but that didn't fly, obviously, for obvious reasons. 
So entrepreneur is it, which essentially means the risk-taking capitalist or the person who invests capital in some enterprise and hopes to make profits and not suffer losses. We'll get to them later on, too. Right now, we're sort of surveying the basic situation. Of the to everybody, Crusoe and us have goals which we want to meet and which we prioritize. We put in terms of priorities and we list them in ranked order. And you pick what's your best choice, most valuable choice, what you think is going to be best. Everybody's got a rank of choices. And you pick what's your highest value and you hope you can prove to be correct. This is called... I call it a value scale, but it's been given the name in economics of utility. And it's, it's a little unfortunate, again, because utility often means useful, in the sense of objectively useful. But in economics, it means purely subjective valuation. It could be useful or, or not. If people think that it is, that's all we care about in, this, in economics. In other words, a lot of left-wing intellectuals hate cosmetics. They think it's an evil thing for a lot of women to use cosmetics. Well, most women don't agree with this. They like cosmetics. And their value scale, cosmetics rank pretty high. So this is purely subjective. It's, now the thing about utility scales is that it's, they're ordinal, they're ranking. Unfortunately, this is my first big disagreement with every textbook that I know of. Textbooks will give lip service to this. They'll say, yes, it's ordinal. All of a sudden, they start talking about utils. This is three utils, that's two utils. Util being a unit of utility. And they add it up and they multiply it. There's no util. There's no such thing as a util. Who, who's, who's ever seen a util? It's absurd. If you want to choose between going to movie A and movie B, you don't say to yourself, let's see, I, I value this at eight util. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so forget it. Forget util. It's my first injunction. <laughs> it's a purely ordinal ranking order. The mathematics often called lexicographic. We could say we rank it one, two, three, four, but it should be ranked as lexicographically, in other words, A, B, C, D. The use of the number sucks economists into thinking that you can do something. We can add, subtract. If you use A and B and C, nobody would say C is twice B. Okay? It's one of the sociological phenomena here which we're dealing with. So there's no such thing as usual. It's strictly ordinal. It's strictly ranking and rank order. All the laws of economics are qualitative and not quantitative. See, one of the problems with economists is they take a qualitative science, which is really what this is, and try to convert it to being quantitative because they can predict precisely what's going to happen. They can't do that. The prediction is always wrong. When they make quantitative predictions, they always flop. And what they do is that they keep flopping. And they keep saying, well, we have to change the model. We missed out on X, Y, Z. They change it and they still flop. This has been going on now for 20 years. Some economists begin to realize that it's also customers of economists, people who buy forecasts, corporations, and so forth, beginning to realize this thing is a, is a scam. One of the reasons why the customers of economic forecasters haven't turned on them before this is because it's a tax write-off. You see, it's considered a legitimate expense to hire economists. Everybody hires economists to tell you what the unemployment rate's going to be next year. And if it's, if it's a lousy unemployment rate, so what? You've hired a top economist. Everybody else missed the forecast. And your expenses can be written off as a legitimate tax write-off of one sort or another. So we have a qualitative discipline. There are laws about tendency and direction, not about quantitative. And there are only hunches about quantitative. Let's get back to Crusoe. We're going to make a couple of simplifying assumptions here. He's got a bunch of logs. He's chopped down a bunch of logs. So we're going to assume that one log or one set of logs can be used for each of three or four different uses. So you can take these logs and say, okay, what's my first priority? He's got an ordinal value scale, ordinal utility scale. Well, his top priority is food for tonight. To make the logs for a fire to cook tonight's meat. I think in the case of Crusoe, we, have, we can come to much more agreement than we would about which movie to go to. He's down to basics here, down to survival. Second priority might be fire for tomorrow night, to keep it for tomorrow. Okay, third priority, let's say, is building a cabin. Fourth priority might be setting a perimeter of logs around the around those little camps so that wolves won't come in or whatever. Perimeter. And fifth priority... Building a boardwalk down on the beach, obviously a real luxury item. His toes won't be full of sand. Now, he has these logs. The point is, if he has a supply, a supply, by the way, is defined as an amount of n units of a homogeneous good, meaning that each unit is the same as any other, other unit. So what you're dealing with is the same log or the same horse or the same, for more or less practical purposes, they're interchangeable. You're not dealing with two totally different types of wood or something like that. So it supplies n units of a homogeneous good. If he's got one log, that's all he's got, or one unit, he will satisfy the top priority and let the others go by the board. He will not satisfy priority three and forget about one. In other words, he will pick his highest priority. 
If he has two logs, he'll pick his first two priority, and so forth. Now, looking at it another way, supposing he's got three logs and he loses one, a wave comes and washes it away or something like that, he will give up his lowest priority, priority three. He won't, he won't forget about food tonight. He will rearrange the logs so as to knock out three and leave one and two. If, on the other hand, he's got five logs and he loses one, he'll give up the boardwalk. He's not going to give up the really tough stuff. Okay, what do we deduce from this? We deduce that the greater the supply of a good, the greater the number of units that a person has, the lower the value of the ranking of each unit. So the value now is how much he's willing to give up. That was the ranking of how much he loses if he loses one unit. If he's got a supply of three units and loses one, the value of each unit is number three or third or C, whatever you want to call it. The greater the supply, the lower the value of each unit. Technically, the lower the marginal utility, because utility means value, marginal means each unit. This is highfalutin jargon again, but it's basically that's what it means. So marginal means the next unit of one log, one pound of butter, whatever the unit happens to be. The greater the supply, the lower the value of each unit and the lower the marginal utility. Vice versa. In almost every law in economics, you can just switch it around. Simply logic. The lower the supply of a good, the greater the value of each unit. This is called, there's a name for this, the law of diminishing marginal utility. It's really saying the same thing. The greater the supply, the lower the value of each unit. And we can put this in a little diagram. The diagram is supposed to be used for in economics to make it clearer. Unfortunately, in most cases, they're used to make it more complicated. Anyway, if you put margin utility or value of each unit on the y-axis, and all economic diagrams in microeconomics, the y-axis is either margin utility or price or something like that. The x-axis is quantity or whatever. Okay, in this case, we have quantity of a good. This is zero for both. So what they're saying is, as you increase the quantity of units, one, two, three, four, whatever, the margin utility keeps dropping. And we don't know what the height is because it's ordinal. Probably even shouldn't connect the, the dots. But anyway, we know it's falling. Obviously, the, the greater the number of units, the lower the value of each unit. The less of the number of units, the greater the value. So this is supposed to be a way of showing this. Pay no attention to the actual distances or things like that. This is the basis of what's known as the law of demand or the analysis of consumer demand on the market. How much will people pay for products? Obviously, if you have, well, if you have one chess set, you're not going to pay as much for a second one, presumably, given the kind of chess set. The law of demand, based on the law of diminishing margin utility, is trying to figure out how much people spend on different, how much people buy different goods, given their different prices. Let's take Wonder Bread, one of my favorite humor purchases. I like Wonder Bread. I buy lots of Wonder Bread. However, if the price of Wonder Bread suddenly magically, let's say the Wonder Company, whatever the name of the company is, Mr. Wonder sells out or whatever, some other guy comes, the other guy's a nut. Okay? And the other guy says, I think Wonder Bread is so great, a consumer should have to pay a lot of money for it. It's really worth 10 bucks a loaf. He issues an order to all the Wonder Bread people who only sell the thing for 10 bucks a loaf. So what happens? Well, what happens is this. Now you have the basic diagram. You have price on the y-axis, price of the good. What does price mean? Price actually means how much you're willing to pay or what the what the different terms of the exchange are. In other words, uh, with Crusoe and Friday, let's say Crusoe fishes and Friday hunts. And so Crusoe has, has a lot of fish, and he, they decide on one barrel of fish per two pounds of meat or whatever it is. Pure bargaining situation. When they do that, the price is, the terms of exchange, the quantity of one exchange, one good in exchange, is paired to the other good. Now, in other words, two pounds of meat per, per one barrel of fish. In this case, the price is one fish in terms of meat. When we have money, and we have things that are very simplified, and everything is in terms of money price. So the exchange is between the money and the specific good. So here you have a situation, let's say with Wonder Bread, if we insist on $10 a loaf, very few people will buy it. Let's say this, this is $1 a loaf. On this axis, you have quantity, again, quantity purchased. So I don't know how many loaves of Wonder Bread are sold in the United States or New York at any given time. Uh, let's say 100,000 loaves. 100,000 loaves, say, in New York in a week. So the quantity is 100,000. The price is a dollar a loaf. So if Mr. Wonder suddenly insists on $10 a loaf, very few people want to buy it. The only people who will buy it are very wealthy Wonder Bread freaks. If David Rockefeller loves Wonder Bread, which is probably dubious, he might shell out a lot of money. Very few of the rest of us will join him in this. The quantity suddenly plummets. This much will be purchased. He, he will go bankrupt pretty early. 
On the other hand, supposing he's succeeded by another nut, an opposite kind of nut, who says, well, I think that the Wonder Bread is so great that every person in the world will be able to afford Wonder Bread. I'm going to sell it for a nickel a loaf. Of course, he loses a lot of money per loaf, but he's also crazy. And a nickel loaf, lots of people buy it. Hear about a nickel loaf? Hey, Wonder Bread's a nickel loaf. You stop buying Pepperidge Farms or, or Tasty or whatever, you rush to buy one. What the hell? You might not like it too well, but a nickel loaf is worth it. You get a huge you know, two million loaves or so. <laughs> <laughs> it says that much seduce. You get something like this. This is the great law of demand. The law of demand, which is related to, related to two things. One is the diminishing margin of utility to keep increasing the supply. And two is the fact that some people are poorer than others and they can't afford to spend a lot of money on, on one specific item. You wind up with a law of demand, which is very simple, and, but a very important, probably the most important single law in microeconomics. Namely, the lower the price, the more will be purchased. We don't know how much more. See, that's what we don't know. We know it will be more. That's an absolute law. How much? Depends on the specific item, it depends on the, specific, the people. It's sort of like wide punches. But we do know, absolutely, the lower the price, the more will be purchased. This is called a falling demand curve. We also know, again, conversely, again, there's always the other side of the coin, the higher the price, the less will be purchased. Again, saying the same thing. We don't know the shape. As a matter of fact, usually before, say, 19, I guess the demand curve came in about 1920 or something like that. The key problem in microeconomics, the key difference between quantity demanded and the demand curve. The demand curve is the whole curve. The demand curve is a locus of, given the price, how much will be purchased. Given a high price, given a medium price, low price. And you map out, it depends on the subject of desire. You don't know exactly what it is because it's in the heads of every person. But you do know that the lower the price, the more will be demanded. So this gives you a demand curve. So that means if you go down the curve, the price is lower, there'll be higher quantity demanded. But the curve as a whole is falling. And the demand curve as a whole is the structure. It depends on how, what people think of Wonder Bread, basically, how much income they've got. And competing products, Pepperidge Farm Bread or Tasty Bread, Rolls or whatever. Say, all these things are competing with Wonder Bread. This determines the demand curve in accordance with the subjective value scales, utility scales of the people. Once given this, this gives you the whole demand curve. And the point is, you, have, you must never confuse the quantity demanded at each point. In other words, at, at 50 cents a loaf, 200,000 loaves will be demanded. Okay? That's the quantity demanded at each point. You should never confuse that with the entire demand curve, which is the locus of all quantities demanded at every price. You should never confuse the quantity demanded at any given price with the demand curve as a whole. Now, the point is that a demand curve as a whole cannot change if price changes, the key. In other words, a falling price will not increase the demand curve, ever. Can't, because the demand curve is defined as a response to prices, price change. All right? The one thing which cannot increase the demand curve is a falling price. The one thing which can't lower the demand curve is a rising price, because the whole shape of the demand curve has already been incorporated in the definition of the demand curve. From 1920 or so, when the demand curve starts, until about 1940-45, it was always the same shape in the textbooks. The shape was, was known in mathematics as a rectangular hyperbola. In other words, the area under the curve is the same at every point. Let's say um, the curve is based on a schedule, on tables. Price, quantity, purchase. If the price is $10 a loaf, let's say they sell 1,000 loaves, the total revenue taken in by the wonder, not the net profit, total revenue taken in by the retail stores, price times quantity. Obviously, you charge 10 bucks a loaf, you sell 1,000 loaves, you're making $10,000. So that's total revenue equal price times quantity. Key point. If the price goes down to $5, let's say they sell 20,000 loaves, and the total revenue goes up to 100,000, so forth. But the way the textbooks used to draw the curves is that the area always remained the same. The total was always 10,000 or whatever. It was adjusted in such a way that the area was always the same. Finally, by 1943, George Stiegler, later won a Nobel Prize, a young professor, wrote a textbook called The Theory of Price, he said, there's no evidence for this. Why do they draw the curves that way? What is this nonsense? And so we started drawing as a straight line, which at least doesn't commit you to thinking that the area is the same. There's no evidence for a straight line either. And so sometimes, I think McCloskey's latest book on applied price theory is sort of a maverick type, and he, he draws the lines as wavy. Well, I suppose, you know, it could be wavy. I, I, I still prefer the, the straight lines, provided that you hold it in your head at all times, it's purely convenience. Doesn't mean a damn thing. Unfortunately, most economists don't hold that in their head. 
by the time they get to chapter 8 or something, they're saying the thing is deeply significant. They start talking about tangencies, as you'll see when you go, you go along. Go to all sorts of crazy conclusions based on tangencies which don't exist because there ain't no straight lines. Straight lines are at least easier to cope with, and at least doesn't assume you have a, the area remains. There's no reason for the area remains the same. There's no reason why consumers always spend the same amount of money, regardless of price. At any rate, we now have the man curves with straight lines. And the next thing is dealing with supply. All right, we now have the man curve, which we know is fooling, although we don't know exactly how much. And we have supply. What's supply? Supply, despite the textbooks, supply is vertical. Supply of everything is how much there's around right now. How many blows of one better around at the stores today? Let's say 100,000. So you have, at any given time, the supply is a fixed amount. It changes over time. But the point is, at any given time, and, this, and the demand curve, after all, is a freeze frame situation. How much could be purchased at any given price by consumers? Similarly, the supply curve should be a fixed freeze frame. It's, at any given day, how much is out there? So the supply curve is vertical. You right now know more economics than most of the people in the country. You know more than the jerks who run the subway system, for example. The way most people run utilities, particularly subways, railroads, whatever, they assume that the demand curve is vertical. The implicit is that they don't think about the demand curve, but they implicitly assume the demand curve is vertical, which means that people essentially kick in to buy the same amount of stuff regardless of what the price is. There's no fooling the demand curve. So, for example, every year or so, they, they keep raising a subway fare because they got a deficit. Of course they have a deficit. Government always has a deficit. It's almost by definition. Government's always screwed up. They got a deficit. How do we cure a deficit? We raise the fare. Why not? If you're suffering from a certain deficit, you figure out you can balance the budget. If you, if you raise the price by 20% and you keep the same number of fares, then you'll balance the budget. So they raise the price by 20%, and by God, that next year they find out there's a falling off of rise of fares. So the deficit never gets cured. They always startle of this. Why does the number of fares go down? Why aren't people riding the subway as much as they used to? Gee, I don't know, maybe it's because it's crummy, but it's always crummy. It's not the answer, it's because the fare went up. <laughs> so some fine day in the future, it's not going to be too long from now, they're going to raise the fare again to five bucks, whatever it is, right? And they're going to find out not only the number of rides are going, but the total revenue is going down. That's what they're going to find out. They're going to get up here somewhere <laughs> and find out they're taking in less money than they did before. What are they going to do then? Who knows? They haven't even got the mindset of lowering the fare to get a lot of people. They might even privatize it. That would help. This is to say the general mindset of authority and fair setting business. As you can see, it makes a big difference to businessmen. What happens to total revenue? What happens to total revenue becomes the key thing. So businessmen are extremely interested in total revenue, which I say we're now concentrating on. We'll get later in the term of the cost question. It becomes very important to them what happens if the price changes, say it's raised, you raise the price from here to here, what happens to total revenue? If we now come to the most important property of the demand curve, which is the reaction on the demand curve, as you change the price, what happens to total revenue? In other words, how does quantity react compared to, compared to price? Okay, and law of the ministry margin utility is a key thing that this has accomplished in the history of economic thought. Adam Smith, the alleged founder of economics, actually he really wasn't, but one of the founders of economics as a separate discipline, said in the Wealth of Nations, which was the famous first economic classic, said there's a value paradox, what's called value paradox, and he said he couldn't solve it. That's very peculiar in history of thought, because he had solved it 20 years earlier in his lectures, to late published you know, much later, about 1900 or something. So it's one of these peculiar situations in history of thought. In fact, it had been solved by the scholastic philosophers since the late 16th century. All of a sudden, he creates this problem called the value paradox, and it goes as follows, namely, why is it that Things like bread and water, let's take bread, it's usually called the diamond water paradox, but water is extra complications. At any rate, bread, which is the staff of life, it's very important philosophically to man, because you need it for life, and water, of course, even more. And yet here, bread is very important, it has a high use value. And yet, on the market, it's very cheap. Cheap on the market, therefore, has a low exchange value. One puzzling situation, here's something which has a high use value and a low exchange value. You can probably think of other things. Nails are pretty important for construction. You know, nails are cheap. Okay. On the other hand, you have luxuries. They're fripperies. And here, and this is one of the reasons why Smith fell into it. Smith was a Scottish Calvinist. He wasn't a hardcore Calvinist, but he was a softcore Calvinist. And so he hated luxury anyway. Diamonds are a mere frippery. They have, as he put it, they have no value, no use value. So it's a little extreme. Most of us would say, well, they have, you know, philosophically, they does not have a very high value. They have low use value. Diamonds. Robinson Crusoe and Desert Island would not go for diamonds as the first priority, obviously. 
And yet, look at diamonds. Diamonds are extremely expensive on the market. They have a high exchange value. This is a very strange thing. I can't solve it. And Ricardo, his disciple, said the same thing. Or more, you know, can't solve this. This is a value paradox. Therefore, we can't say anything about consumers, the value to consumers, the whole utility analysis. I can't say anything about it because they're stuck in this thing. They have to deal with the entrepreneurs and business and labor and all that sort of stuff. And consumer analysis drops out of the picture, except in France, where they never talk of this. But Britain had a dominant economic doctrine in the 19th century. So we were, unfortunately, took 100 years to get out of this, to solve the value paradox. From this idea, you see, comes the, the left-wing position, like Veblen and these other characters in late 19th century America and later, saying, well, capitalism, market economy, dresses for production for profit and not for use. They produce things like diamonds, which are for profit of a high value. They don't produce bread and water or something which are of a low value, use value. This dichotomy between production for profit and production for use becomes very important in the history of left-wing thought. By this time, you have the tools in your possession to realize the fallacy of this whole nonsense. Basic fallacy is this. People do not choose on philosophic value. We don't sit around deciding in one big vote. Let's go back to the model of the grand old science fiction movies of the 50s. Some space character interfered, blocks into all television sets. All of a sudden, we're going to what channel you want. Some guy is speaking to you from the planet Ungu or something. And he hands Earthlings, a <laughs> he says, Earthlings, listen, conclude peace now or die in six days. Some planetary character now comes to Earth and he presents us with a choice. From now on, you have a world parliamentary decision. You have a choice of losing forevermore, from now on until the end of eternity, either all the bread and all the diamonds in the world. And that's the choice when the human race is faced with. Well, given that choice, I'm sure we'd choose bread rather than diamonds. And the space people, would, wherever they are, will go off of the diamonds. But the point is, in real life, we're not faced with this kind of a choice. We're not faced with all-encompassing class choice. We're faced with unit choices, marginal choice. The whole point of the unit. When somebody goes to buy something, and they're not faced with a situation of, okay, here's all the bread in the world versus all the diamonds. No, you're faced with things, should I buy this loaf of bread? Or should I buy this diamond with 12 carats or something? In that, in that situation, the marginal unit becomes extremely important. And the law of diminishing marginal utility becomes decisive. If you only had one loaf of bread in the world, people would be willing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for this one little loaf. Fortunately, we have lots of bread. So that each unit, as we deal in units in the real world, each unit, each pound of bread is very, is very cheap because it's a low marginal value. It's like Crusoe with 20 logs instead of one. Depends how much what the supply is. We have a huge supply, fortunately, a huge supply of bread. Therefore, it's cheap. Units are cheap. On the other hand, with diamonds, supply is very, very rare, limited, scarce. That's true we have a government cartel monopoly, which makes it scarcer. I'll get to that when we get to monopoly. So scarce. And so what you have then, even though diamonds... The first unit is much lower, say the least, than the first unit of bread. And not that many units around, as the supply is limited. So we have a higher price for diamonds on the market. In other words, a higher valuation by consumers for each unit, for each carat. I guess is the unit, the unit of weight of diamonds called a carat. The value placed by people on each carat is much higher than the value placed on each loaf of bread. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing paradoxical. There's nothing unphilosophic. There's nothing unnatural about it. It's perfectly legitimate once you see what the whole picture is, once you see the interpenetration between supply and valuation. Now, once you realize about the margin, this whole thing clears up. That solves the value paradox. It took until, it, until the Austrians and other economists in 1871, the margin utility theorists, around 1871, to solve this paradox before margin utility duel. For a hundred years, economics had been misled by Adam Smith into this cul-de-sac where they couldn't analyze consumers' behavior, they couldn't analyze consumer actions because they couldn't understand the value paradox and left themselves wide open for uh, leftists to say, wow, gee, it's a terrible thing. And there's no conflict between production for profit and production for use. What's profitable is what's most useful to the consumer, most valuable, and the demand is highest. Anyway, that solved the, the value paradox. Any exchange that takes place in the market, people only exchange because it's more valuable for them. They prefer what they're getting to what they give up. They prefer the marginal units. In other words, you work, you exchange your labor service of 40 hours a week or whatever for a certain amount of money, or exchange money for loaves of bread or cereals or whatever. You're doing that because you prefer the value you're getting for what to, to the value you're giving up in exchange. And so each step of the way, each kind of exchange that's made on the market, all well, millions of exchanges, benefit both parties to the exchange. What we have is a lattice work of two-person exchanges. 
As always, for every unit exchange, there's a, a two people or two groups and two commodities, including two goods and services. Each unit exchange has two people and two commodities. In the money economy, money is always one part of the equation here. Money is exchanged for, for other things. So the, if you graduate and work for IBM, you're exchanging your labor service for salary, for money. So that's, again, a situation with you and IBM. Even though IBM is not a person, it, it acts as a unit in this situation. So each step of the way, in this lattice work of exchanges, is a both parties benefit. Otherwise, they wouldn't make the exchange to do something else. They go home, they make some other exchange, they keep their money, they or so whatever. Okay, we now get to we get to the most important property of the demand curve, the only property which really is important, as a matter of fact. Remember that the demand curve is falling. It's all we really know about it. So you have on the y-axis, you have price, and the x-axis, you have quantity. And the demand curve tells you it's really a demand schedule. It's a geometric representation of the demand schedule. It tells you at this price, how much will be bought? Price of Wonder Bread is 10 bucks a loaf. This much will be bought. Price of $5 a loaf, this much. Cheaper the price, the more will be purchased. So you have a demand curve which is sloping, so called falling demand curve, a demand curve which slopes downward and to the right. You don't know if it's linear, you don't know if it's steep or shallow or flat. All we know is that it's falling. The important property of the demand curve is how much, if this is like a freeze frame situation, telling you what's in the mind of consumers. Of course, you don't know the demand curve. Who knows? You don't really know. All you know is that it's falling. The important property of the demand curve is if you change the price, let's say if you cut the price from here to here, how much will the quantity increase, or at least in what direction? We know it will increase. We don't know by how much. If it increases just a little bit, you have a steep curve here. It can either do that, or it can increase a lot. We have a much flatter curve, given the, the same point. This property of the man curve is called its elasticity. Once again, it's borrowing the prestige of physics, where the question, for example, is, if you put a certain different weights on a spring, how much will a spring give? There are two different kinds of definitions for elasticity. One kind, which is a textbook definition, there's nothing wrong with it, it's just kind of irrelevant. The more elastic is how much more give there is, in other words, how much the quantity will increase when the price falls. The reason why it's irrelevant is nobody knows anyway. And it's also the really important thing, it's qualitative, the really important thing for the businessman or for the industry is, Will total revenue go up or down? That's what they really care about. If I cut the price, what's going to happen to my total revenue? That's what I want to focus on here. Now, total revenue, business income, net income, is total revenue minus total cost. This is a very simple way of looking at it, but basically it is how much money do you take in a year over the transom or over the cash register or whatever? How much money do you pay out? If you take in 100000 a year, you pay out 80000 Total cost means your net profit is twenty thousand. If, on the other hand, your total revenue is sixty thousand, you pay out eighty thousand. You're in pretty poor shape. You suffer net losses of twenty thousand. So, therefore, total revenue of any firm, or any person, for that matter, equals the price of anything times the quantity sold. Let's take our Wonder Bread example. The curve is based on a schedule. Okay, let's say the price is ten bucks a loaf. You have very few loaves sold. Let's say a thousand. Thousand very wealthy Wonder Bread freaks. But at ten bucks a loaf, you sell a thousand loaves, you get ten thousand dollars total revenue. Very simple concept. Simple but important. If the price is one dollar, you might be selling a hundred thousand loaves. So then your total revenue is a hundred thousand dollars. If the price is a nickel a loaf, you might be selling five hundred thousand. <laughs> What's that? That's five thousand dollars? Is that it? Anyway, that gives you an idea. <laughs> you take the price per unit. Multiply the number of units sold and you get your total revenue. What we're interested in here is, what happens to total revenue? In other words, the key thing that I'm, I'm thinking on here is the direction. What happens to total revenue with the change in price? If when you cut the price, if quantity increases by bigger, greater proportion, you have an increase in total revenue, uh, that's an elastic demand curve. You raise the price, then you have a fall in total revenue. It's not easy to forecast in advance what the demand curve will be, because it will change across the zone and it can be different from different things. So that's an elastic demand curve. On the other hand, if you have a demand curve which is relatively steep, then you'd have the new total revenue be smaller. In other words, the increase in quantity is not enough to offset the drop in price. So the result, lower total revenue. So in this situation, where a fall in price leads to a fall in total revenue. 
Or looking at it again the other way around, if you raise the price from here to here, you got an increase in total revenue. This is something that businessmen are very interested in. They don't care that much about the percentage, the amount, all about the formula. They care about what happens to the damn total revenue. Because in the real world, businessmen don't know that a man, the man curves are not listed up in the book for them. They have to try to find out. And it's not easy to find out. It's part of the, the job of the entrepreneur, the businessman, is try to figure out what's going on. This situation is called an inelastic demand curve. Inelastic. So in other words, we're setting up here a new definition of elastic and inelastic. Instead of concentrating on percentages, we're concentrating on the direction of total revenue. If the total revenue increases in the fall of the fall in price, you have an inelastic demand curve. If it drops to the form price, you have an inelastic demand curve, and vice versa. So what can we say about when things will be elastic or inelastic? Well, for one thing, we can say that other things being equal, a larger range of choice will lead to greater elasticity. In other words, let's say this is a, we're back to our Wonder Bread example. Here's the price of Wonder Bread. Say a buck, this is a buck a loaf. Let's say Mr. Wonder, you know, choose a huge increase in price. Sales are going to fall off tremendously because all the other breads will remain the same price. Rolls, bread, everything is a buck a loaf or so. He's raising his price to $5, $10 a loaf. It means a tremendous falling off. It means the demand curve is very elastic for Wonder Bread. So that's one of the reasons he's not going to do it if he's sane. On the other hand, if all the breads go up together, that's a different story. Then there'll still be a falling off, but people won't be able to like, shift out of Wonder Bread into pepperidge form or whatever. They'll all be going up. So in that situation, it would be much steeper. It could still be elastic, but be less elastic for each given firm or each given brand. Same way on the way down. So one thing we could conclude from this is the demand curve in all cases, regardless of how elastic the demand curve is, the demand curve for the firm, any given firm, is more elastic than the demand curve for the industry as a whole. Unless, of course, there's only one firm in the industry, in which case it's the same thing. When you have a big gap Say the demand curve for each firm is quite elastic, and the demand curve of the industry as a whole is, very, is inelastic. It sets up a temptation for a cartel agreement among the firms because if they can get together and agree to cut production and raise price, they'll all benefit. All the firms will benefit because then they can, let's say, they raise price by 20%, their production gets cut by 10%, they, get, they pick up more total revenue. But it's only if each firm will keep the agreement. The only time a cartel will last for any length of time is when the government steps in and forces it, prevents new competition from coming in, prevents anybody from breaking the agreement. And this is what's happened in Europe a lot. So elasticity is a major property of demand curve. It's either elastic or inelastic, which means you always have a situation where total revenue either falls or increases when changes in price. And it's obviously extremely important for businessmen to try to figure out what's going to happen. Uh, in the real life, there are no given demand curves. This is about trying to find out what will happen if they raise the price or lower the price. That's a trial and error kind of procedure. And it's much of a hunch and based on their intuitive insight into the market, which is, of course, based on knowledge, but it's based on a, a sort of knowledge economists don't have because we're not in the fish market or the computer market or whatever it is. Each market is, is different, has different people in it, different, all sorts of stuff going on, dynamics. It's only people involved that can figure out 